special day for a couple of reasons. Not only is it uh, 911, and if you watch the news this morning, they're showing uh, reminiscences, if, you, if that's the proper word, of what happened on that fateful day. Uh, but also, it's special because of our guest speaker today. Uh, he is a friend. He is a uh, longtime missionary for not, not just for the Lord, but uh, for us as well. We partnered together for quite a while in supporting uh, this family to the mission field. Chuck and Susan Callahan have uh, served faithfully as missionaries to the military, and that's the other uh, special reason why he's here on this special day. Uh, Chuck Callahan served in the U.S. military uh, for, what, 20 years? Uh, he is, yep, <laughs> United States Army, retired, but then he didn't retire from uh, the military completely. He's been in the Lord's Army longer than that, and uh, stayed uh, with the military in ministering to them, evangelizing them, training them, discipling them in various places. And he's continuing to do that today. So I've asked him to come and share the word of God with us and talk about his ministry, how God is using them in a new er area of ministry. So he's going to share that with us today. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. I do count your pastor as a friend, and uh, I don't get to talk to him enough. And I appreciate every time we can fellowship together. And uh, I am enriched every time I'm around him. So I appreciate him. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're in Joshua, the book of Joshua. Uh, I do want to say thank you. It's been 22 years that you've been a part of our ministry. Uh, to tell you a little bit about myself, you that don't know me, my name is Chuck Callahan. I was born in a little town called Columbus, Ohio. Um, <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm more Buckeye than most. I was born at OSU Hospital, amen? So, uh, but I grew up in a little town west of here called Millersport. That's where I graduated high school, the Sweet Corn Festival, amen? Uh, that's, where, that's where you're from, amen? That's where I, I graduated uh, Millersport High School out there. And I joined the Army in 1978. I didn't have much of a church background. Uh, matter of fact, none, really. And it was a missionary to the U.S. military in 1986 that led me and my wife to the Lord in a place called Gießen, Germany. So that's the, that's the lifeblood that I have is military mission. I finished my career and retired, and then I went to the mission field of Japan for 20 years. And Lord has now called us into a ministry of AFBM, Armed Forces Baptist Missions. Now, do me a favor. And, and out there on the Welcome Center out there is a card just like this. It's called a prayer card. Please take one of those cards, put it where you can find it. If you need two or three, that's fine, because what I need more than anything is prayer. Amen? Uh, I'm traveling. I've already uh, traveled 35,000 miles since last October. When I leave here on Thursday, I'm headed to Longview, Texas, Dallas, Texas, back to South Carolina. And then I'm going to see my wife at the end of September sometime. Amen? But Susan does send her greetings, and I uh, wish she could be here, but uh, she's working, at, well, not working, she has a ministry now at South Haven uh, Christian Academy, teaching little four-year-olds, amen, and that is her wheelhouse, she, she loves that. We have six children, and uh, we grew them up, so she's trying to grow some others up now, amen. But I want to just thank you for you being a part of our ministry all these years, amen. When you get to heaven, there's going to be fruit to your account that you just didn't know was there, amen? Now, in Joshua chapter 4, the children are about to go into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. Joshua has taken over from Moses, uh, and he is now leading the nation of Israel. And they're going into the promised land, finally. And we read this in Joshua chapter 4, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe, a man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared for the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. Let us pray. Father, we just add your blessing. I ask your blessing upon the reading of your word. Lord, open our hearts and, and just uh, our spirit to your word this morning. May we be challenged 
on this very special day. Father, we love you and we give you praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I told Brother Don this morning I really enjoyed his lesson. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, he's talking about the rock, Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. Amen? And then Wayne comes up here, and by the way, he's done a great job. I've been working with him. He's finally starting to hit those high registers. <laughs> if you've ever heard me sing, you know that's a joke. Amen? But uh, that was great. Rock of ages. Amen? We're talking about stones this morning, rocks. And they were being taken up and, and going across the Jordan with them. Now, I have to kind of give you a little bit insight into my life. I have been blessed beyond measure. I've seen a lot of this world. It's been six and a half years in Germany. I have stood in a place uh, in Gießen, Germany, that was the headquarters of uh, the Luftwaffe or the German Army or Air Force at that time. I saw a picture of Hitler and Goring. I stood right there. History. History, right? I love history. I, I talked to a man. He was our bus driver that was a soldier during World War II for the German Army. And I've talked to other people like that. And then I go to Japan, and me and your pastor, how many of you ever seen that movie, A Hacksaw Ridge? Me and your pastor has actually walked that ridge. We were in Kakazu Hill, where the largest uh, loss of artillery in one day, 24 tanks were lost by the United States Army in a battle on Okinawa. I have talked to a man that was on the flight deck of the aircraft carriers that attacked Pearl Harbor. I have talked to people that have literally were there the day that the Americans invaded Okinawa. I've been to a lot of places. I've seen the Eiffel Tower. I, I've seen people walking through, through the Ark of Triumph, the German army. I see it in old pictures, and I see American army walking through that same Ark of Triumph. I've been inside that Ark. And on top of it, it's a museum today. I have seen a lot of things, been a lot of places. I've been at Dachau, a very infamous German concentration camp, and I've walked those roads. And I've seen a lot of history, but it's history. And memorials are set up to that history. We, most of us in here, now there's a lot of young people in here too, that don't remember this. But a lot of us do, don't we? When we think of 9-11, isn't that what sometimes comes to your mind? September 8th, 2001, I was at a church, Heritage Baptist Church. The next day, they were preparing to dedicate a building to their youth and for the uh, youth around them. They were going to open it up to, to the county. Uh, they were going to use it. There was dignitaries going to be there. There was going to be a congressperson. Uh, there was going to be all kinds of people there. And they were going to dedicate this building for the use of the youth. It's very exciting. We helped clean it up. We helped set up tables and everything else. And on September 9th, we dedicated that building at that church. I was a missionary presenting my ministry. And, and we dedicated that building. On Monday morning, we left Heritage Baptist Church, came to an intersection. And right across the street from Heritage Baptist Church was a little uh, airport called Somerset. Some of you might kind of recall that a little bit. So on Tuesday morning, my sister calls me and tells me about this and how Flight 93 went down in Pennsylvania in a little place called Somerset Airport was starting to become a recovery site. You know that building we dedicated? Became the headquarters for the recovery of Flight 93. Where were you? Where were you? And there's memorials set up. Today, they're going to read all 2,977 names that died on that day. Total, 2,977 were killed, along with 19 hijackers. Of those, 246 were on the four planes, 2,606 were in the World Trade Center, and the surrounding area, and 125 were at the Pentagon. Most deaths were civilians, but 344 firefighters, 71 law enforcement officers, and 55 military personnel were also killed. Most of those people left their home that morning expecting to return at night. Some of those people had plans for vacations. Some people were probably fixing to retire and 
and enjoy their next phase of life. Something, isn't it? Kind of sobering, isn't it? Where were you on September 11, 2001? Very sobering, isn't it? I can remember times in history where I was at when President Kennedy was shot. I was sitting there watching TV, and I started crying, and my mom said, what's wrong with you? I said, they interrupted the program. Some guy got shot, and she came out and said, oh, the president got shot, and I was like, bet my cartoon. I knew what was important. Amen. (laughs) When they landed on the moon, my mom and dad let us stay up late that night, and me and my three sisters were playing Monopoly as Neil Armstrong said those famous words, one small step. I remember places where I was in history in my lifetime. I remember being at Dachau. I remember seeing a lot of places. But it's those places that we were a part of is what we remember the most, isn't it? These people were going across Jordan. It was a very momentum time in their life. And they wanted to make a memorial. And in verse 5, of Joshua chapter 4, it says, And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. I took that picture. That is where the World Trade Center stood. If you look down at the bottom right, you'll see names there. Names of people that perished that day. But what you don't see a lot of time is this. This is underground. This is in the museum. This is the steel that was bent on that day. But you know what you see also? The foundation that still stands today. But every part of that on top was destroyed. That's underground. When our lives are falling apart, you know what people see? They see what's on top. But what foundation do you have? What memorial do you have? A guy once asked, he said, when you die and people come to your funeral, what would you like to hear said? The guy said, I want somebody to come by, look in my casket and say, you're not dead, get up. But at our funeral, what will people say? What memorials have we left? Since 9-11, how many people have died for the cause of terrorism and for the safety of this world? How many people have given their lives to join the United States military and other agencies to protect our rights so that this will never happen again? But yet now our borders are being invaded by... People from other countries bringing in all kinds of junk into this world. And we just seem to be just happy in our little world. But when you die, you said, man, I was kind of hoping for something a little bit more cheery this morning. Sorry, it's 9-11. What do you want? What would be said? I can say, well, he, he served 20 years in the Army. He was a missionary to the U.S. military in Japan for 20 years. He was with Armed Forces Baptist Missions, which is dedicated to starting churches and servicemen centers around the world to our U.S. military. But what will be said about those things? Well, he was a soldier, but he was a lousy soldier. He was a missionary, and he just really played lousy golf. That part's true. He was with AFBM, but all he did was just nothing. What will be said? What will be our memorial? Joshua 4, 6 says, That this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in the time to come, what mean ye by these rocks? The memorial was not for the people that were there, but for the people to come afterwards and say, By what do you mean by these rocks? What do these rocks stand for? Why were they put in place? Why were these rocks there? And when our life is over, will people say, what was their life about? 
What mean ye by your life? What mean ye by this thing that you've left behind? Now, I have six children. Not all of them have turned out the way I want. And in spite of me, they've actually turned out better in some cases. Amen? But when my children look at our lives, I wonder what they think. What met you by your life? What, what have you left behind? Once again, I've been very blessed to be around the world and see a lot of stuff. But they're all just memorials for something that happened then. What buildings or what memorials are we building today? What is our life about? Well, it's about Jesus Christ. But when somebody talks to you, is it about Jesus? Peter would you not agree with me? Peter was a pretty good guy. He, he wrote a couple books of the Bible. But he also denied Christ three times. And when they said, your speech be, uh, betrayeth thee, he what? Started talking like the world. When we talk, what do people hear? Do they hear a memorial for what God has done in our life? Or do they hear a memorial about what we want? to be remembered about and kind of like in our own little dream world. Hey, look, when I look in the mirror, I don't see a short, white-haired guy that's kind of getting a little, you know, you know, a little short. No, I see a briar, you know, no. Man, you look in the mirror and you're like, what happened? That train must have been a huge one, amen, you know? <laughs> God has done so much in my life. So much. And I just want, I don't know if it is, but I just want my life to be a memorial for him. In my funeral, I want people to say he served the Lord well and told funny jokes. Probably say his jokes are eh, corny but clean. That's our motto, amen, you know? But what are the, well, what's the memorials that we're leaving? And by the way, those memorials started the day it happened. I want you to get that concept. Those memorials started the day it happened. You say, well, I've got too much life behind me. People, do, you know, and just heard a preacher. His name was, uh, he's from Connecticut. And he, he said he left home and he never wanted to return home again. And now he pastors a church in his hometown. He says there's so pros and cons to that. Pros, they know me. The con is, they know me. Amen? When we talk, when we walk, you know, I, I joined the Army in 1978, and they ushered us into Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and, and, and they, they said, hey, we're really glad to have you here today. If you would like, would you like to put on this nice new clothes? Would, would you like to have some dinner? <laughs> yeah, right. Three o'clock in the morning, a guy with a brown round gets on, on the bus at one of them smoky bear hats and says, last person off this bus, I own them. I was in the back of the bus. I was the third one off that bus. He scared the daylight out of me. I said, I didn't know my dad was here. You know? And then they said, you're going to dress like this, you're going to walk like this, you're going to talk like this, you're going to think like this. What was basic training all about? To change me from a civilian to a soldier. So that I could shoot, move, and communicate. So that I could follow orders. So I could dig ditches. Yeah. <laughs> Low crawling and all that fun stuff. Amen. You know what happens with Christians? We never really go through basic training. A Christian ought to walk differently, talk differently, act differently, sound. We ought to just be different. Why? Because that's what the Bible says. We're a new creature in Christ. Amen? Isn't that something? And on this day, we remember 9-11. A day for most of us that are very vivid still in our brain. Uh, a day that I'll never forget. We, turned on, we were actually traveling in an RV. We turned on the generator 
turned on the TV and watched the second tower get hit. You know what happened after 9-11? I was already retired. Soldiers I trained, people I knew were deployed. Some lost their lives. Some came back never the same. And we can remember 9-11, but what about the soldiers? What about the families? What about all the people that were affected by it afterwards and still today, 21 years later? We're still being affected by it. But when it comes to God and what God has done for us, how many of us are really still affected by it? On May 29, 1986, at 9B Lunar Garden Strasse, apartment 18, a guy walked up my st uh, the steps of our uh, apartment building and walked into our house and said, do you have a Bible? Now, I thought this was a great, awesome thing. Do you have a Bible? Lead them to the Lord with their Bible. I thought about this years later, and I contemplated it. I said, wow. So I learned to lead people to the Lord out of different versions and stuff uh, instead of the one that I use. And, and, and I thought this, and I'd go into a, a place and say, do you got a Bible? And they'd hand me their Bible, and I'd be able to lead them to the Lord. So years later, I get to sit down with this guy. He was preaching out of my church in Japan. And I said, Pastor, remember that day you came to our house and asked me if I had a Bible? He goes, yeah. I forgot mine in the Bible, you, or in the car, you didn't have an elevator, and I was about to go back down and get it. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> you know, I guess, well, there goes that theory, right, you know? But if you walk into my house today, what you will find at my house, in the corner in our living room, is a pulpit. It was the pulpit I stood behind on April 7, 2002, and preached my very first message as a missionary pastor at Bible Baptist Church. I preached my very last message behind that same pulpit last year at Lighthouse Baptist Church, Okinawa. And you know what you'll find on top of that pulpit? A Bible. A Bible my mother-in-law had given us. A Bible I didn't know anything about. It was an old King James Schofield Bible. And that was the Bible that that pastor, that missionary, that man, led me and my wife to the Lord to. It's a memorial. Why? Because when you walk in my living room, I want you to say, what mean ye by that? What is that about? How come you got a pulpit and a Bible in your living room? So I can tell you my testimony. Just like Paul did in Acts chapter 26 and verse 18 when he told King Agrippa to open their eyes to turn them from uh, darkness unto light. From the power of Satan unto God. That I want to be able to give him a testimony. So I want a testimony. So, you know, this is what's weird. I had all these Lighthouse Baptist Church shirts made up and all this stuff. And I'd go on base and I'd walk around Camp Zama. I'd walk around NAF Sugi, walk around Camp Foster, walk around Camp Kinzer, walk around all these places, Lighthouse Baptist Church. Everybody's like, you know. I'd go in there with Ohio State shirt on there. Oh! I oh, got a conversation going. People getting to church, amen, you know. Dead serious, amen. It, it was great. I, I, I got more Ohio State shirts so I could start conversation. The guy, go blue. I was like, I need to talk to you, son. You need saved. But anyway. <laughs> but what is the purpose of memorials? So we can ask the question, what mean ye these things? What mean ye these things? What is meant by our life? What is meant? Joshua is going over, and, there, and he said, look, we're going to make a memorial so that when our children ask, so when our children ask, I've had my children ask me, why in the world are we in this country? Why aren't we in America? And I tell them. Because on May 29th, 1986, at 9B Lunar Grove, Strauss, Apartment 18, the Lord changed my life. And we're here, according to my life verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, for I delivered unto you first of all, listen to that, I delivered unto you first of all, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, 
how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Why is my life the way it is right now? Because I simply want to deliver what I first received. This is all about delivering what we first received. God's been so good. You stood up this morning, you sung the praises, right? You, you say, God bless you. But when we walk out that door, what does our life reflect? I got under conviction. It was funny. I, I used to have a little fish on my car. And a preacher did it. He got up and said, if you need a fish on your car to tell people you're a Christian, <laughs> get another car. <laughs> little bumper sticker, you know. Jesus loves you and all this. Uh, no. Go out to my car, you won't find nothing. Bet, when I get back to Virginia, I will have license plates that says AFCM. <laughs> it's going to cost me 20 bucks. Give me 20 bucks, right? Armed Forces Baptist Missions is what I'm a part of now. And we are dedicated to starting churches, servicemen centers, and equipping local churches around military bases to give the gospel to our military. Now, that's, that's a memorized off the webpage thing. What is our mission? To make memorials for God. To give the gospel wherever our military is at. Why? Because after 9-11, they volunteered to serve in our services so that we could sit here this morning and be free, just like the people in Korea did in Vietnam and World War II and, and World War I and all the other ones, so that we can be free this morning to build memorials for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I lived in Japan. The Shinto Shrine, nothing. They're everywhere. Every little housing area, when we lived in uh, Marihara, when we lived in uh, um, Ginawan, there, there was these, uh, uh, Tatsunodai, that's what I was saying. But when we lived there, there was places all in the era, housing areas, little shrines where you could just go by and do your little incense and thing. We go to the Buddhist thing, they're trying, <laughs> and then they bow. You know why they clap three times? They're trying to wake their god up. Dead serious. Climb Mount Fuji, you get a walking stick, had bells on top. You know why? Letting your God know that you're coming. And then there's a Tory gate at top, and a lot of people don't understand what that Tory gate is. That's a Shinto shrine. You walk through it for good luck. First time I walked through it, when I found out what it was about, I walked around it. But check, check this out. Did you know on our military basis today, you go to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and I was sitting there, my wife needs new ID cards, so I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the services that are offered at the chapel. Catholic service on top, Protestant service, not Baptist, Protestant. And then they have the other things. And you know what the last thing was? Pagan. Pagan services. And if you go out on a military warship in the middle of the Pacific today, you go to a Wicca service. Witchcraft. So that's what, by the way, don't be surprised. I may get in trouble for this one. Don't criticize and talk about lost people acting like lost people and saved people won't act like saved people. They're just doing what they think is right. By the way, Paul, when he was Saul, just did what he thought was right for God. He was destroying the church, but he was serving God. Yahweh, Jehovah. He was serving the Jewish God. And he was destroying the threat to his religion and to his faith. Saul was doing only what he thought was right and by the law. Kill the infidel. Kill the non-believers, the people of the way. He was just doing what he thought was right. And on the road to Damascus, he had a choice whether to acknowledge God or ignore him. He had a choice. He had letters. He had power. He could have just walked away, but he chose to become Paul. Peter, I mean, look at what he went through. Walking on the water, falling down, uh, denying Christ three times. 
asking what about John and the other disciple. And Jesus said, oh, Peter, just follow me. But yet we have two books that are pretty incredible where Peter says they grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? Because he knew what he was talking about. He had a lot of grace and a lot of knowledge to do. You know what happens? Our excuses become our reasons. Now, an excuse is something to say, well, yeah, I know you invited me to dinner, but I have other, no, that's an, yeah, no. When we have reasons not to serve, and, and when we can point at other people and say, well, I'm much better than them, it kind of lets us off the hook a little bit, doesn't it? Go with me to the book of Matthew. Chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 6. This may be a, a familiar story to most of you. If you've never heard of it, it's a pretty awesome story. It says, now when Jesus was in Beth uh, Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? Verse 9, For this anointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me, for ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not, uh, ye have not always. Verse 12. For in that he saith, for she hath poured this ointment on my body, and she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, verse 13, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? This woman's doing something that nobody else can understand. In, in 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah is, is following Elijah. Elijah is about to take, be taken up in a whirlwind. And, and, and they're talking about, oh, you are going to stay here. Don't you know your master's supposed to be? Even the preacher, Elijah, was saying, hey, you stay here. And Elijah said, no, as my soul liveth, I'm going to go where you go. Why? Because he knew where the blessing was. He knew where the, the presence of God was going to be. So many times we quit so short. So this is 9-11. I'm here representing military missions. I've served with people that have died in combat. I have served and trained people that, praise God, they came back alive. That's pretty awesome. But what have we done since then? Well, every 9-11, we think about 9-11. It's kind of easy, 9-11. If it had been 9-12, it wouldn't have been rolling off our tongue so well. Amen? It's kind of like 7-11, 9-11, right? You ask a lot of people, they can't even remember what year it was, just 9-11. They remember that some guys ran a plane into a thing. But what memorials have we set up since then? I've been... To, to the towers, and, and I, I've walked around in a very solemn area, and I, I've seen those foundations, and I've seen the bent steel. But what have we done? And what have we done for the cause of Christ in Calvary? What memorials have we laid for that? That's pretty incredible stuff, isn't it? Pretty incredible stuff. And I sit there, and I think about a guy in Japan. His name was Simon. He came to church with his wife and two kids, and he looked at me and said, don't you dare preach to me. You met Simon, right? Simon and Tabitha? Yep. Simon, you're about to hear a good story. Simon told me, don't preach to me. Don't you dare talk to me about Christ. Don't you. <laughs> he said, I'm here for my wife and my two kids. So they were with us for five years. He was the IT guy at the hospital, head IT guy up there, very smart guy. And I'd sit there, and I'd be in church, and if you notice, I'd move around a little bit, right? 
And I'd walk by him, and he'd be. Now, our church was in our living room when it started, so it was easy, right? And he'd be sitting there texting, looking at the website, ordering things off of Amazon and stuff. He'd be doing everything but listening and participating. But he was faithful to every service because of his wife and kids. And all of a sudden, we were doing some remodeling at church, and he showed up. And he helped me remodel and helped me paint. And we talked, just talked, just talked. The last service last year in Okinawa, he came, he, he took me outside and he said, Pastor, I was like, wait a minute, he's called me Pastor before, but never like that. That was different. He said, Pastor, on August 13th, 2005, I turned my back on God. He said, I was in Iraq. It was a bad day. It was a horrible day. He said, I did things, saw things, was part of things that I should never have been a part of, saw or did. He said, it was a bad day. And I blamed God and I turned my back on God. I was like, wow, I didn't know that. Been with me five years, didn't know that. He said, but today, I want you to know, Pastor, I've got more peace than I've ever had in my life. And me and God are like this. You see, what happened is over time, I go by him, and all of a sudden, he had a Bible program up. Tried to hide it from me at first. But all of a sudden, he was listening. And God got a hold of him. And he said this. When I go back to this place, I'll start going to church for me. That's huge, isn't it? Isn't that huge? Why? Because we were just simply trying to deliver what we first received. The great salvation of God. Amen? Did we remember things? I, I call my kids and I say, June 6th, what happened on June 6th? What year? 1944. Oh, D-Day, yeah. I love history, right? And I, I love dates and stuff. I, I say, hey, what, what's today? August 6th. Uh, oh, Hiroshima, the bombing, uh, August 9th, oh, the Nagasaki. They, they know these things. Why? Because I do that. But you know what else I do? I say, I want you to know your grandpa. His name was Chuck. He was a mechanic. He had a third grade education. I want you to know your mom. She dropped out of high school at 10, uh, uh, in the 10th grade, and by the time she was 21, she had me, and I was number four. But, they, but she brought up eight kids. And your dad, your grandpa did the best he could with the third grade education, and he always provided for us. I want you to know your grandma and grandpa. Uh, the, in Lafayette, they, they own the Green Apple Truck Stop. I want you to know them. I want you to know them. By the way, I want you to know some other things, too. I want you to know about your mom. Your mom, hard worker, always been a hard worker. But when she got saved, she dedicated herself to the Lord and to you. And when most people would say she sacrificed, she would say, I built memorials. She wouldn't use those words, but, you know, it kind of goes with the theme today, you know. This is what I know. Today could be the day where you are on this side of Jordan, and you could be starting to pick up some stones, and you could walk across Jordan, and you could lay a stone into the promised land, into the land of God, and you could rededicate your life. You could re, re just start over and say, I want to get into basic training. And I want to walk differently. And I want to talk differently. And I want to be a soldier for Christ. My whole life's been dedicated to the military. It's very hard for me to talk to civilian churches sometimes. I was on debitation. Pastor so kindly put his arm around me. He said, brother, you need to leave the high and tight. And you need to stop preaching like you're talking to soldiers. He said, half my congregation are scared of you, and the other half are hiding. <laughs> well, you military people in here, I was a first sergeant. <laughs> I knew how to tell people where to go. Anyway, to heaven. What were you thinking? So anyway, I'll tell you what. I softened up. Why? Because I realized it was more important to be able to give the gospel than it was to be first sergeant. And when I got overseas, <laughs> it was awesome. Because I'd deal with Marines, I'd deal with Air Force, I'd deal, deal with Navy, I'd deal with the Army, amen? Just with all kinds of guys. 
that when they came in, I could sit them down and say, look, you're an idiot. <laughs> All right, you're being a jerk. You need to get your heart right. Yeah, I could talk, but Savine comes in, I go, so what's the problem? <laughs> How can I help you? You know, I mean, it's a whole different world, right? But can I tell you, the whole purpose was to build memorials for God. And we've got people today that are serving God through the military work and everything else that, that are pastors, assistant pastors, uh, youth pastors, all kinds of stuff. We've got just really great church members. But this is one thing I always told them. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. What happens today and what happens tomorrow is what matters. See, we're going to, in just a couple of minutes, go into the time of what's called invitation. Invitation is a very unique thing in church. Most people don't understand what it is. You see, the invitation is simply this, yes or no. That's invitation. In the Old Testament, they would bring the sacrifice to the altar, and the high priest would, would check it out and accept it or reject it. And if they accepted it, they put it up on the altar, and they put their hands on it. And he'd kill it for their sin, to cover their sin, or for the national sin, or whatever type of sacrifice they're doing. But our sacrifice has been given through Jesus Christ. He is the perfect Lamb of God. And he, he is the one we should be building memorials to. It's his name above all names. No other name but Jesus. And an invitation is a time to say, Lord, I heard the message this morning. I heard the preacher talk about the 9-11 and the memorials and, and, and that I should build a memorial and, and that I should rededicate my life or, or, or ask for strength or whatever you have. That, that you know, I haven't been living for you. I haven't really been doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I haven't built memorials for you. But today, Lord, no. <laughs> it ain't going to happen today either. You say, does that happen? Absolutely. Let's not fool ourselves. But what if just one person would say, yes, today will be a day of change. Today will be a day of rededication. Today I will start basic training and I will get into the word of God and I will start praying hardy and uh, with zeal and, and I will stand, start changing things and tomorrow I will wake up and this is the day that the Lord hath made and I will rejoice and be glad in it, Psalm 118, 24. And I will start building memorials and I'll pick up those stones and I'll make a stone. So when somebody walks into my house and they say, what meaneth these stones? And you'll say, Jesus meaneth these stones. 9-11 was a horrible day. Most of us remember where it was. But the day I remember more vividly than anything was the day that preacher said, you must be born again. Are you a sinner? I just said, go there. <laughs> you got a book? All right. I was 29, already in the army for seven years. We won't go there. Amen? But you know something? My kids know very little about May 29th, 1986, or before. Sometimes we'll slip something out. We'll be around family. They'll say something. They'll go, you? You were like that? No, they're talking about my twin brother that died. <laughs> he died on May 29, 1986. And I was born again. I asked my kids about May 29, 1986 and on. They can tell you about those things. But they can't tell you much about before that. Why? Because those aren't the memorials I want to build. I don't want to glorify in my sin. I want to glorify in him and what he did for me. So the other part of the invitation is, yes, today will be the day. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You mean today if I claim that verse? Well, if you're like me, you're going to claim it today, tomorrow, next day, next day, next day, next day. You're going to wake up in the morning with the first thing in your mind, trying to quote Psalm 118.24. For this is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Why? Because some days I don't want to wake up and build a memorial for God. Some days I want to tear them down and I just want to complain and whine and cry. I'm going to drive from here to Longview. You think on Sunday morning, on the next Sunday, I'm going to be up there going, yeah, I just drove a thousand miles. Woo That's why I'm taking three days to do it. Because you see, I want to make sure that when I get there, I'm praising his name. So I'm taking three days. 
My wife said, pay for the extra hotel night. Take three days so that when you get there, we can praise his name. I like my wife. <laughs> She's all right. Can I tell you that there's an invitation? And the invitation is very simple. Would you build a memorial for God? There's been enough in the world. I've been through so many of them. You say, oh, I'm old and I'm not. Whatever excuses you got. God's only got one excuse. I died for you. I saved you. I cleaned your sin. I took your sin upon me. He only has one reason to even prepare us a place, be an intercessor for us. And that's because he loved us. So your question is, how much do you love God? Are we going to honor and memorialize 9-11 today? Yeah. Will June 6th come around and remember D-Day? Yeah. But how many of us will take that day we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior and start picking up some stones and building memorials to it? Father, we love you. We give you praise. I thank you for Crossroads Baptist Church and the years of ministry that they've partnered with us in. I thank you for the military veterans that are in here today. I thank you that we can remember 9-11 and, and that we can have a solemn moment today and, and say, may it never happen again. But Lord, we don't know. But Father, I do know this. The greatest day that I ever had was the day that you came into my life and saved me. When you came into my life and, and changed it. Father, thank you for that day. Thank you for this day. But Father, there's been many days in between where I have failed you and I've let you down. So Father, even today, I rededicate my life to you. Father, may I build memorials that will last. And in that day, that they come to my funeral, that they look down and say he just simply tried his best to honor, praise, and glorify his God. Father, we love you and we give you praise. As the pastor comes, won't you come?